Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. You know, uh, May 10th, it's going to be the 15th anniversary of Word Balloon. And uh, I can't believe it. 15 years. Unbelievable, man. I, uh, I forget, forgive me, I have no other adjectives, but, uh, I wanted to look back at a few episodes leading up to the big anniversary and, uh, remember some of the exceptional, uh, moments and conversations that I've had over these 15 years and, uh, wanted to start things off with, uh, one of the greats, he's no longer with us, but, uh, such an important part of the Silver Age and the Bronze Age, uh, well into the 2000s, the great Gene Colan. You remember his stuff, Tomb of Dracula, Daredevil, so many wonderful things at Marvel. Also, so many wonderful things at DC, both preceding his Marvel work and after his Marvel work. Uh, I, I talk about his pseudonym, Adam Austin, and he gives me the full background on that when he was actually working at both companies and didn't want to reveal things. But uh, this was really a career-spanning uh, conversation. We talked a lot about uh, his early influences as a kid, how much movies and uh, literally the composition of an image on screen uh, informed uh, his early uh, attempts at uh, comic books as well. And uh, really goes into a lot about his process. And uh, it was just a great conversation. He was a sweetheart of a guy. And I sadly remember the last uh, New York Comic Con that I saw him at. Me and another uh, podcaster, Rick Gordon, went up to his table. And, man, Gene just looked worn out. And I, I just felt so horrible for him. He was even having some uh, personal issues uh, within his uh, relationship with his wife. And uh, it just it really broke our hearts. And that was the last time we saw Gene. And I don't mean to end on a downer because... Uh, he's, he's, you know, past the misery of, of his health and uh, whatever personal problems he was going through. And we can look back at this wonderful career. Such an inspiration to so many great artists and writers. Uh, and uh, we talk a lot about some of his classic runs. So I think you're going to enjoy this conversation today. Word Balloon at 15 with Gene Colan on today's episode of Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners, my uh, sponsors via Patreon. I thank you greatly for your support. It means a lot, and uh, we keep getting new people uh, every month, and I really genuinely appreciate it. If you like what you hear on Word Balloon, if you think it's worth the br- uh, price of a comic book or a dollar a month even, um, I really appreciate the support. You can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or the front page of wordballoon.com. But I thank you greatly for your support, uh, the league that backs me up, the League of Word Balloon listeners. This episode of Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They are shaking things up at your local shop right now. This month was already the debut of John Layman's The Man Who Effed Up Time. There's also other great comics on the way from Aftershock. Things like Stephanie Phillips and her brand new series that debuts in March, Artemis and the Assassins. There's also Undone by Blood by Zach Thompson and Gone Killers by Mark Sable. They'll be going along with some of your Aftershock favorites, things like Dark Red from Tim Seeley and Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe and Baby Teeth with Donny Cates and Gary Brown, Animosity from Marguerite Bennett, so many great books from Garth Ennis, including Jimmy's Bastards and, of course, A Walk Through Hell. It's a great pantheon of collections of titles and wonderful creators that you've loved throughout the years at Aftershock uh, and uh, their work beyond. Uh, they, they've they managed to uh, get some of the, the big names in comics to come and do Aftershock books and also uh, break new writers and artists as well. And uh, always interesting genre-bending stories, and I think you will find one that fits your interests right at their website. Go there now. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the way to get these books through the diamond codes to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right. Do you miss the old uh, word balloon uh, intro? If you have you been on the journey with me for fifteen years, uh, this is a representation of the original Gene Colan uh, episode. Now, when I first put it out, I was putting a few episodes or with more content behind a paywall, and Gene was one of those people that I initially put the longer episode behind the paywall. And then around two thousand eight or two thousand nine. Uh, I decided to release uh, the full episode. So that's what you're getting now, um, along with uh, my introduction to Gene. And, uh, you know, it's uh, in context, it's interesting to hear what were my thoughts as I was representing this. I should point out that uh, unlike today's episodes that have uh, wonderful fidelity and great sound, uh, this was recorded in 2005. I was just getting started. I would say the sound quality level is basically we both sound like we're on the phone or even an old cassette uh, kind of conversation. It's clear enough. You'll understand our words, 
but it's not that uh, great uh, sound that, of course, as uh, online media has grown up, uh, the fidelity has gotten better. So I hope you will bear with me and uh, still enjoy this excellent conversation with Gene Colon on Word Balloon. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. This is John Suntris. In last week's episode, I spoke to Mike Grell, and we talked about his art style. And he had mentioned that, unlike a lot of other people who use inkers, Mike takes his pencils directly, draws on vellum. That vellum is uh, transferred onto art paper, and uh, the stuff gets colored, and that's how uh, the process happens for his art. There's another great artist that came a bit before Mike, but was a contemporary of his and continues to produce great work today. The great Gene Colan, who you know from work on Daredevil, Captain America, and so many Marvel projects, but also great DC work, uh, good stuff for Batman and Wonder Woman, and uh, also uh, went on to uh, do some great stuff with Don McGregor, uh, things like Nathaniel Dusk, an interesting Private Eye series that he did. And Gene also is a guy that likes to, as he say, paint with pencils. In 2005, I had an excellent conversation with Gene and really was a good career-spanning conversation and had such a wonderful time speaking with him. It was on my old RSS feed. I haven't put it on the new one. So for those of you who haven't heard it, I'm going to represent the interview today, and I hope you enjoy it. Very pleased to speak with Gene. I hope to see him in New York at the uh, New York Comic Con, which is coming up in 2008 in just a month. So if you're out there as well, make sure you stop by and say hello. But uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation that I had with Gene talking about his career, and we present it again here on Word Balloon. The conversation starts with uh, Gene going back to his days as a boy, and he talks about some of the early comic strips that were among his favorites. My favorite was, it appeared in the New York Sun, Dickie Dare. That was something I think Kniff had before he ever got into Terry and the Pirates. Eventually, an artist by the name of Colton Waugh, W-A-U-G-H, he did it, and I was just, I, I really sunk into that one. Dickie Dare, I could not wait for the next day's episode. It was a daily thing. Uh, it didn't appear in the Sunday paper, though. And my father would come home from business and out of the New York subway, and I'd grab the son of before he even got to the last step. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very big thing. Uh, I looked at the others, too, uh, Alex Raymond and uh, Flash Gordon and Prince Valiant, Harold Forster. Sure. And especially Milton Kinnis. In our previous conversation, you mentioned you're a film buff. Yes. And that uh, the frame composition in a film would inspire yes. the way you would design panels. Yes. Uh, I grew up in the age of uh, black and white movies. And I didn't care much for color because I never saw real life in color. It's just you, you pass through uh, your days and not even think about color. Uh, I don't know why that is. It just never occurred to me. And uh, the black and white... Uh, presentation was always more dramatic. Uh, I just love the, the variations of gray tone that you would get in a black and white film. And I believed it better. I, even though everything was in gray, uh, I, I, I somehow uh, fell for the story a lot faster than if it were in color. Color scene is almost like a, a very unreal presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Can you name some filmmakers that inspired your work? Well, um, yeah, I probably could. You caught me off guard. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I, one of my all-time fa favorites was Treasure of Sierra Madre. Oh, yeah. Was that John Houston? Houston? John Houston. Sure. His father was in it. So yes, Walter Houston. Houston. Yes. Yeah. I remember that very well, and boy, what a movie that was. And oh, there yeah. were others. Uh, How about Billy Wilder? I'm thinking some of the noir directors. Uh, yes, him also. Didn't he do The Apartment? Yes, he did. Wilder? Oh, yes, he did. Yes. And Double Indemnity? And Double Indemnity, right. They were great films. Great. Uh, the, I, I, I even like the Sherlock Holmes series. That's a rebel. Yeah. He was the definitive Sherlock Holmes. And I don't care how many other characters took his place through the years. Nobody pulled it off and or looked like, I think, uh, Sherlock Holmes should look than Basil Rathbone. He was fantastic. No, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Your wife describes your style as painting with pencils. Yes. Um, how finished were your pencils, uh, your okay. pencil drawings before the inkers would get the pages? Uh, uh, pretty finished. Any any uh, decent inker could follow it. I had a tendency to put in half tones, which uh, it, it, it would confuse the inker or, or put him on a path that he didn't care to deal with. Not all inkers. Some inkers would uh, accept it as a challenge, but most of them, you know, they wanted to turn the work out, so they would abbreviate whatever I had there. They would either leave it out. Or, uh, well, actually, they would just plain leave it out. They wouldn't put in half tones. They wouldn't bother with it. Um, 
Not until Palm, uh, Tom Palmer came along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a great fit for you. Yes, he was. And I also liked Al Williamson a lot. Sure. Because he, he would put in his tone work with a, a croco pen. And he would do it with fine line. He was a wonderful artist. Um, and so was Tom. We we did that uh, Dracula series for uh, 10, 11 years, something like that, mm -hmm. on a regular run. And how fast would uh, would you be able to draw a page when you were on that monthly schedule and you had several monthly books running? Uh, I had to do at least two a day. Wow. And uh, that was an awesome thing. I mean, I, everything had to go by the board. The, uh, I would uh, sit down, and I guess around nine o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't be finished until maybe two or three. I mean, in the in the following morning. So it it, it was a grueling thing. I was never fast. I tried to be at different times when I got a little fed up with the with the late hours and all, but it didn't hang around long because I I knew it wasn't my best, and I would almost uh, without noticing it drift back into my old routine of of uh, being slow and very, very ultra-careful. And that took time. With the advances in technology, obviously that helps your style. You don't have to worry about an anchor because they can no, really they take can your work. Anything. Yeah, they can. And I've seen, I've seen uh, the colorist's uh, uh, record job, too. Sure. Uh, today, uh, with all of the technical uh, things at their fingertips, I would the coloring has a tendency to be dark. And my pencils are dark enough, so dark on top of dark makes it almost impossible to read. It depends on the colorist as to what he wants to do with the job. If he wants to make a, a, a job that anyone can see and understand, he could do it. But I don't know what happens. Maybe they think that they're expected to do it dark because that's how I generally work. You know, That's why they call the book In the Shadows. <laughs> uh, I don't really know. Um, but uh, it certainly helped as far as I'm concerned, to be able to have my pencils reproduced for the comic books. And a lot of your recent work is, is like that now, and that's... And it's it is all good. that way. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. are, you, are you able to work with colorers today when you are uh, a colorist? Well, I will give color notes, or I would uh, tell them on the phone, I would tell the editor that they shouldn't put... They should put highlights here and not there, color the characters or, or the entire panel in a very sparing way. Have you tried to draw with a computer yourself? No, uh, these days? I have no interest in doing it. It would seem like your subtle style of shading might be lost or harder to replicate. Now, if I'm trying to paint something, put a wash effect over it, I'd rather do it all myself, by hand, with a brush, rather than to go into the mechanics of what a very smooth, slick-looking job. I think it takes away from the character of the work, and then that's totally lost. Uh, and then it looks like an airbrush slick... It could be, too, that I'm old-fashioned and I don't really want to get into all these modern things. Uh, <laughs> as far as computers are concerned, I'll leave that to Hollywood. Going back to some of your early years, it seems like you did every genre they would throw at you. You were capable of, whether it was Western, science fiction, romance, heroes. Whatever they would tell me to do, if I, even if I was not familiar with that type of artwork, if, if dragons were involved or cities under the sea, which I hated doing, because <laughs> that was really like science fiction, and I had to really stretch to pull that off, and I wasn't good at it. I never thought I was good at that. Present-day stuff that everybody knows about, I can do. Okay. But when they throw in science fiction and things that never have been seen before where it's up to the imagination of the artist, I didn't feel that that was anything that I would want to get into. I didn't really enjoy it, but I would never turn it down. I would do the very best I could do with it. But I didn't like it. Well, now that's interesting because I was going to ask about your run on the Submariner in Tales to Astonish. Didn't enjoy it. Very interesting. No, I didn't because I didn't like the Submariner's head. I, uh, the, the shape of the head, it was very difficult for me to do because it's flat on the top, mm -hmm. and you didn't have a chance. I didn't feel that I could get into making him as a good-looking person with that flat head of his. But, <laughs> uh, I, uh, that's what they gave me, again. And I, uh, even though I didn't like it, I would uh, go along with it. I might have said something here or there to stand that, can you put me on a different book? I, I would be better in, in doing something else. Did you ever discuss with Bill Everett, because he was a contemporary with you in the 60s in Marvel, and he no. certainly had that history creating the character. No, I never did. Okay. No. And he followed you on, on Submariner, it seems. 
Yes, uh, I think he created that character. He did, and then came back to it in the 60s after your run. I never followed up with uh, Bill as to what he did after or before. Okay. Um, he was there in the art department. I knew him pretty well. He never went beyond that. In okay. fact, the only one I really uh, enjoyed and uh, was... Uh, I felt uh, I was privileged to uh, be in his company with Sid Shores. Yes, the Captain America artist of the 50s. Yes, he could. You talk about westerns and stuff like that. He could do anything with no scrap. And he was sensational. And, and he helped guide your, your style oh, and helped refine yes, it? Yes. Okay. I ran into an artistic problem, which were many at that time, because I didn't know a thing. I was as green as grass. <laughs> and he, uh, he would come right in and... and uh, show me in a split second where I went wrong and how easy it would be to do it right. Who is Adam Austin? Oh, well, that was, I was working for DC then. Okay. And I felt that if DC knew I was working for Marvel, that might cause a problem for me. Because they were in, the, in, in an area where they wanted to keep the artists that they had. They didn't want them wandering, wandering over to other people. Sure. So I, uh, I spoke to Stan about it because I was working for Marvel. Uh, or timely, and uh, Stan said, well, so look, let's give you another name, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, artwork is like handwriting. You cannot disguise it. Uh, people that are into the art will know, can pick your work out almost blindfolded. Uh, it, it, it's nothing you really can disguise. So I didn't get away with it. Everybody knew who I was, <laughs> Adam Austin, so I just dropped the okay. name after a while. I said, oh, the heck with this. <laughs> <laughs> was Iron Man your next assignment? I don't know exactly what who came first. I think Daredevil then uh, Iron Man, <clears throat> Captain America was in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, well, there were others too. Let's talk about Daredevil then. You took over after John Romita left, and I'm assuming that was when he left to pick up Spider Man from Ditko. Yes. And then you took over Daredevil. Was there was there an idea that you had going in that you wanted to convey in the character that? You so I, I picked up, I love the way John Romita did it, so I picked up just the way he did it. And by familiarity through, through the, uh, the months that passed, I began in subtle ways to make changes on, on the body itself. Uh, the costuming was always there, but I, I, I slimmed them down a wee bit. My style did creep in, although I wasn't aware of any style. It just happened. You know, it? just like that. You, you get involved in the storytelling of it and the uh, uh, the drawing of it and how can I make it look better or different than I've done it before. Those are the things I got involved with. And, and how realistic could I make it? And could I, could I convince the reader that this is not just a comic book? This may be the real thing. <laughs> well, yeah, and where, where did you get your inspiration for some of those acrobatic positions that he had? Probably the films. Okay. Uh, I kept trying to think maybe some Tarzan movie. I, I really don't know where I got that from. Okay. Uh, but uh, there it was, and I had to uh, make something of it. And so I would begin to pick up photographs, information that would help me vary the poses and put them in uh, something different than the typical stuff. And so many of those moves were made up and were so exaggerated. Uh, Jack Kirby was a big help there, too. I mean, not where he would converse with me and tell me how I could do it better, or, or nor did I ask him. Uh, he was just, I, I didn't really know him, uh, other than to meet him in the hall and say hello. So did you work in the bullpen, or would you work yes, at home? Yes, I did. I started out in the bullpen. Okay. And yes. uh, you've mentioned John Bushima as being there, John Bushima as Yeah, he was sitting up a couple of uh, seats ahead of me. Okay. Uh, he came along very uh, shortly after I, I started. And then almost immediately, uh, John Romita came in. And then I think after him, uh, John B. Simmer, I'm not so sure of the order, but they were very close coming on to uh, Timely at the time. In 1969, you had three top-selling books where you were doing the art. Captain America, Daredevil, and Doctor Strange. Yeah. And that must have been a grueling schedule to get three of those books out. They were all very popular at the time as well. Yeah, I just wouldn't, you know, was, I couldn't say no. <laughs> so I would take on more than I really should have. Your Doctor Strange was really interesting because you still conveyed 
amazing work on the magic end of things. Mm -hmm. But as you say, you seem to enjoy a lot of the cityscapes, and your cityscapes with Doctor Strange have much more realism, especially on making Greenwich Village look right. Well, I would go in with a camera to, to Greenwich Village. I had a Polaroid camera, one of the first that came out, and I would go down there and photograph uh, the village during the daytime and sometimes even at night. And that's what I use for reference. I, I, rather than dream it up, any artist can sit down and dream up buildings. Mm -hmm. But are they real? Do they look convincing? Uh, you know, the architecture in New York is, is quite something on, on some of the older buildings. Sure. And, uh, and I figured, well, whoever knows New York will recognize everything. And for those that have never been, will uh, also be interested because the, uh, the buildings were all from reference. Everything was from reference. The cars and the street, and sometimes the street itself. Uh, usually that way, yeah. The street would be also referenced. Uh, so I really made, I enjoyed it. I had a very good time doing all that stuff. Uh, and then and then bringing it together in the story. I'd have a whole bunch of photographs in front of me. Uh, and I would, uh, this was more on a freelance basis when I started doing that. Okay. When I was working in the bullpen, I didn't do any of that. But when I was in, the, when we all had to, when we all left timely and went uh, into freelancing, that's mm -hmm. when I was at home. That's when I was uh, more at ease and I could uh, sort of concentrate more on what I thought would improve the art. Did you then have, you know, a file that you would refer to in terms oh, of? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I still have it. With me, you should see the, some of the old cars that existed at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I still have kept them, but you never know when you're going to get a period piece. Well, and your style, too, lends itself to those kind of more realistic crime stories. Well, I guess, yeah, it did, but... In a good way. Yes, some of the stories that I had. And, 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 th and there was a very old uh, car that I used a lot in Dracula. <laughs> uh, it looked like an old packet. Sure. Uh, I used that. Uh, look, it looked like a car that a chauffeur only would drive. Very uh, cool. It was a toy, you know, uh -huh. uh, and, it, and it had all the right looks. It looked pretty darn authentic, authentic so I would use that. And that and that also grew into planes, and I still have them, uh, fighter aircraft that existed during the first war. Wow. And uh, I don't have much else other uh, in, in that category, nor do I have ships. But I do have a, a folders on it. And whatever books I could buy at the time that would enhance it, I would get those books. I, I was always trying to think ahead. What might I need if something like uh, Dragon showed up uh, or something that I haven't done before? And you have to kind of think ahead as what the possibilities would be for you uh, to have uh, stories that you're not too familiar with but do need scrap for. Uh, I tried to, uh, in many instances, that was, uh, Rolls Royces were, was one car that would come up often, and I would find one on the street somewhere and photograph. I once went into a showroom pretending I was interested in buying one. <laughs> <laughs> and so they gave me a brochure showing the Rolls Royce in various positions, you know, sure. profile, back view, front view. Interior, yeah. And all that, yeah. And uh, when I moved to Vermont, they had an antique car show every year. And all these cars, the real thing. Wow. And so I'd take my camera and spend a whole day at the show photographing one after the other. Well, before we leave the subject of cars, we should acknowledge uh, a scene that I know that you're proud of in, in Captain America 116, a car chase between yeah. Cap and the Red Skull. That's right. Talk and about I, that and what inspired well, you. Well, I was a very, uh, oh, I was so enthralled with the film Bullet. The Steve I, McQueen film? Yeah. I've never seen a car chase ever on the screen like that. Usually it's on for a minute or two, and then it's over. But this this was the biggest uh, attempt at a car chase, and I knew that there were uh, that this car chase was going to be special the minute they uh, they buckled up in the car, put on the safety belt, <laughs> because that would prepare the audience for a thrill, and that's exactly what they got, <laughs> and especially me. And so I waited for an opportunity in any of the books that I was doing, Daredevil or Captain America, where, where I could do that. And, and I eventually got one. No one else had that in mind but mm -hmm. me. And I, I must have eaten up maybe five or six pages, something like that, <laughs> of a car chase scene. Stan was furious <laughs> because it ate into the plot. 
and then I'd be squeezed at the end to try to fit everything in there. The readers loved it. They they sent in their uh, uh, thinking on it, and it, it, it caught the attention of a lot of fans. Now, you were uh, creating these stories um, in the Marvel style back then. Stan yeah. would, like, kind of give you the germ of a story, and then it was up to you to really flesh it out. Oh, yeah. And then he would dialogue it later. Right. And you've told me that you used to work not from thumbnails. You would kind of work extemporaneously. That's right. I would just start with panel one. I'd read the, the script uh, ahead a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, up to maybe the third page, and I would see that not much changes as to where the characters are and what's happening. How big was, like, a, an early script from Stan before you started drawing? How long was the script? Oh, maybe uh, 18 pages, something okay. in that area. About the length of the, the actual of the, book? Of the whole story. Okay. He would just give me and any of the other artists that could do it a brief thumbnail idea of what the plot was. This is the beginning, this is the middle, and that's the end. And I, would, uh, I wouldn't come into the city with that. I would tape record him uh, telling me this over the phone. Okay. And that way I could follow the the uh, the message that he left for me uh, on the recorder and uh, and and space it out the way he tells it and I would figure well this will take just so many pages and this should take so many and and uh, I would uh, equal it out until uh, I felt that it, it would in my mind now I didn't make notes or anything mm -hmm. uh, that it should eat up about 18 pages or so far and to tell the story. And sometimes I would run into trouble, and other times I would be right on the nail head, and uh, it was more of a, I, I just couldn't stand doing thumbnail sketches of these things. It, it, I just wanted to get right to it, you know? Would it have been repetitive to thumbnail and then draw it in big form? Yeah, it might take away some of the pleasure of, of being surprised by the story. So I said... Uh, that I would read maybe two or three pages ahead to make sure that there are no location changes and no uh, uh, clothing changes. Mm -hmm. And then I would figure, well, I, not much happening here. Uh, they're doing a particular thing, and it, it takes up three pages to do it. So I would start, you know? Sure. And I was usually on the money. I, I, I don't think I ever regretted doing it that way. Now, John Romita was a more careful artist. He... Uh, he would uh, try to make certain that everything would be just right, and he would uh, he needed uh, felt that he he had to have these uh, thumbnail sketches to uh, to tell it properly. Uh, I wasn't as exacting as that. I've never been that way, and I uh, might have been better if I had. But <laughs> I just you know was being myself. Sure. And uh, hope, hoping and praying that it all worked out. It was more or less flying by the seat of my pants with these things. Now, your nickname was The Dean, and I know that was obviously a rhyme with your name, uh, but, or, or Stan would always give nicknames for the alliteration, like, like Jaunty J or Jolly Jack. Yeah. But, but, but being The Dean, did, did some of the young artists come to you for advice on how to design a page? No. Really? <laughs> no, I've never had anyone ask me, uh, how should I do this? No. No, okay. No, no, each artist is just did his thing. You, uh, you followed Storenko on, on Cap, and you really had, which was a tough act to follow, because really for such a small body of work, Storenko really came and, and shook things up, I think, as far as his yes. book on Cap. Yes. And you followed up with some really interesting stories, and, and also one of them involved Cap in Vietnam. And you also had Daredevil in Vietnam, too. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Stan was writing the book at the time. Was there any flack about, you know, covering the story? I mean, it certainly wasn't anything new. There were World War II stories no. happening during the war. No. Same thing for Vietnam, I guess. No, there was no, uh, there was no problem with any of it. In fact, I was doing stuff to, uh, of the Korean War. Uh, you know, where they'd come over the hill and charge, blowing bugles and everything. Uh, so I did a lot of war stuff. A lot during those years, um, but uh, you know it was a cut and dry thing. The story would would be written, and it was up to the artist and the bullpen to turn them out. Well, and I really got involved with that because I've seen a lot of war films and I enjoy them all, and it, that would help a lot, uh, an awful lot. And then when I met uh, uh, Severin, John Severin, mm -hmm. who was uh, just as acting as you could get with uniforms and uh, uh, weapons. Uh, he he would draw like the M1 rifle, uh, right right down to the last 
nut and screw. <laughs> and you, you, he wouldn't miss anything. And he was very accurate with them. And he put me onto a military book with all of these weapons photographed in there. And uh, that was a big source of mine for uh, war weapons. And I, I insisted that they be very accurate. Uh, eventually, it led to, to a collection of guns. Uh, real, the real thing, because I lived in Vermont, it's very easy to have a gun. I see. In Vermont, and so I had rifles, I had handguns, and eventually I sold them all, you know, because I moved. Okay. And I'm down here, now we don't want to move back, but not <laughs> to Vermont. No? Where you no. Think, where you thinking of moving? Uh, Manhattan. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if I could afford it, but we're going to go forward with it anyway. Well, good luck with that. We'll see what, what happens. I'm like you, I'm a city guy, I need action. You live in Manhattan? I live in Chicago, actually. Oh, you know what? Chicago look, looks exactly, or New York looks exactly like Chicago. Sure, those old-style working-class cities, absolutely. Oh, I was confused recently. I went to the, one, the Chicago convention, and I thought that I was on Fifth Avenue. Actually, on Fifth, thought I was there. <laughs> uh, it threw me, really did. But the difference is that New York has a lot of schmutz. Uh, garbage laying all over the place. Yeah, yeah. At least it did when I was there last. But uh, Chicago, you can eat off the sidewalk. <laughs> I there wouldn't, but okay. And I know, but there isn't any <laughs> any indication of garbage pails. You're right. You're right. It, it's a very clean city. I'll pass that on to the mayor. I think he'll yeah. appreciate that. That's good. Uh, it is an apple pie order. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I have a lot of the old architect architecture there that you see in New York. You bet. Let's let's talk about Tomb of Dracula. Yeah. And it had Boston as its backdrop, and I and I know you said you did a lot of photo. Uh... Yeah, I went to Boston uh, to photograph there as well, and I love doing uh, Dracula, and I love some of the characters that Marv Wolfman had eventually put in it. Harold, Harold. Yes. Kind of looked like a Woody Allen or something. <laughs> a goofy looking guy. Well, that was such an interesting book, and first of all. What was it like doing a horror book after they had been banned by regular comics for so long? Oh, I loved it. I didn't, I didn't wonder about it being banned or anything. If it was out there and they, got, they made it into a comic book and they wanted me to do it, oh, that was all I needed to know. There were no comic code authority concerns in terms of what uh, you could do or anything? Uh, I don't remember on Dracula. Uh, there was a comic code mm -hmm. that had to be obeyed. And then, and then eventually, it, uh, Marvel and all the the other companies ran into a lot of trouble. Back uh, in the fifties, yes. Yeah, around there, and then uh, uh, there was a big threat of these companies just folding up, and along with it went all the jobs, me included. I was out of work in comics for about five, six years. Yeah, that was a real tough time when the Very when bad. the industry really kind of folded into itself, yes, and so many yes. companies had gone away. That's right. Now you you said you've always been fascinated by horror. Yes. Going back to a child. Yes. What was the film that really uh, shook you up? The first thing, I was five years old. And I lived in the Bronx. My father took me to see Frankenstein. Uh, it traumatized me forever. Wow. I was a basket case when I came out of there. I couldn't sleep. I, 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 I it, it was impossible to deal with. Uh, thank, uh, what is it? Um, but even before that, even before that, it. Uh, Halloween fright the daylight out of me. I would <laughs> not go in the streets. I didn't want to because the kids knew it, you know. They'd come out with these false faces and I'd run like hell. That's pretty amazing then to, to feel that way as a child and then to do the, the body of work you did with Dracula. As you say, 10 or 11 years at Marvel and yeah. then subsequent miniseries following that, both at Marvel and at Dark Horse. Yes, I, I just love the atmosphere in it. You know, old castles, the cemeteries, the fog. All that stuff. Uh, I've always been interested in that. And there was a great soap opera element to the whole story, too. Yes. Uh, Shadow something? Uh, oh, like Dark Shadow, sure. Yeah. No, but, I, didn't, I didn't watch that. Okay. Uh, I never did, uh, but, I, but I'm familiar with the character. Uh, I thought that uh, Jack Palance would be a far better looking uh, Dracula than anything I'd ever seen. And that was your that was your physical model for, for the was, look of Dracula. That was my model. He my did he did Jekyll and Hyde on television. Yes, he did, and that came first. And then I even watching Jekyll and Hyde, I said, Jesus, this guy should be Dracula. But, 
you know, and they, they gave him a whole makeup job for Jekyll and Hyde, which he played to a T. And it happens to be one of his favorite, if not the favorite film he ever made. After that, he did, not long after, maybe a year later or less, six months, he did Dracula. And I didn't think he was as good in Dracula as he was in, uh, in Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde. Hyde no. And he had such a serpentine-looking face. Yes, he does. Oh, my God. Yeah, he was in a, a, a fighter. An ex-fighter. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he has a brother that looks very similar to him. Let's talk about Blade. Okay. Such an interesting character that was a good counterpoint for the for the series. And yeah, th and well, I've thought of him. We've discussed what he should look like, and a uh, good-looking black guy, young, and wearing... Uh, and he, he would describe how we wanted him to look with a leather jacket and a little bandolier around both sides of his chest with little knives in it and one big sword behind him. And then I put, I did that, I put boots on him uh, to give him a kind of a rugged, adventurous look. I didn't uh, work all that hard on it. I mean, that was the the impression I got as he spoke. And, you know, comic book artists never sit down and with big, uh, at a, at a, at a uh, convention table and discuss how they're going to do this and how they're <laughs> going to do that. It was always over the phone, very quickly, or uh, in passing each other. We spent a few minutes talking about it, maybe 15 or so, and that would be it. That's all that was required. And the character is responsible for really Marvel getting into the film business successfully. That that really was the film even before Spider-Man and X-Men that, that started the, the you know yes. success. But Marv never, never made anything out of it, and neither did I. I'm yeah, that's pretty mind, lousy. But. That's pretty lousy. Yeah. Well, the, I don't know what happened. Uh, I think Marvel had a lot to do with it. They wanted the whole damn pie and not share any of it. Stan was uh, uh, Marvel's uh, main editor, but he didn't stay there long. Right. Uh, Shooter eventually came in, and I knew that, that day was the worst day of my life. I did. We didn't have a good rapport with each other because I knew what he what he was up to. Uh, he isn't the first one of that type that I'd seen before. Um, and so we never got along, uh, and unfortunately we were scheduled to speak in Connecticut uh, on the radio about comics, and uh, he would, he did the driving, I was the passenger, and there was no one else with us, and he didn't say one word to me on that trip. Wow. So I could see, you know, where, where this was going, and I didn't feel comfortable with it, and eventually, in no time at all, he, uh, he gave me nothing but trouble. And it was so bad, I had to leave the company. Either that or wind up in the hospital. So I, I decided to hell with this. My, my hope is worth more. Did, so did Tomb of Dracula end first, and then you left Marvel, or was uh, it simultaneous? It, I think that I just had enough. Sure. Even, I mean, before Shooter came on, I believe. And then Shooter came along, and he started to write some of the plots. And I, I had the whole thing just... I didn't really want to continue with Marvel, because it was too long on the one job and it gets to the point where the writer gets stale and the artist gets stale. They have no further ideas of what to do and, and television's the same way. So uh, we ju I, I wanted to bow out and then Marv said, well then he wasn't going to continue to write it either. But uh, it, we continued to, to do it anyway. You know, it was mostly just talk. Were you, were you able then to, to get to the ending that you guys wanted? Not really. I don't. I can't remember okay. whether he ended it properly or didn't. Uh, I just got tired of the damn thing. Sure. Uh, I don't know if Shooter came aboard before it ended or what, but when he took it over, it got worse. Sure. He turned it into a black and white book too. Um, it just we didn't get along, so I I walked out on a pension plan that I could have had at the time. Uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, but I felt that my health was more important. No, I respect and that. Fortunately for me, I had a place to go, and that was D.C. Absolutely. And before we get to D.C., one, one other wonderful project you had at Marvel was Steve Gerber, and that's Howard the Duck. Yes. What a funny book, and what was oh. it like doing such an edgy satire at a, at a pretty tame time in the business? I thought that he was a very unique writer, not typical and by any means, and that he had a lot of talent in him, and he could have written a, a novel, and he would have done very well. I thought he could have written a screenplay. A wonderful writer and funny as hell. I I would really enjoy see I never really read these these stories, not particularly. Uh, 
but in his case, before I would put a line down, I'd read read the book that he would, uh, or the plot that he'd come up with, and I'd laugh my head off. <laughs> he was a very funny guy. And, and what an interesting strip that really showcased your versatility, because yeah. you had the juxtaposition of all these real people yes. and the very cartoony duck. Yeah. Well, uh, when I first did it, I thought that Howard looked too much like Donald Duck. Howard never wore pants. <laughs> uh, he had that that little tail in the in the back, a little feathery tail. He sure. Cute looking, but that's how uh, Donald Duck was presented, and his face was might as well have been Donald, except that uh, Howard wore a hat, and smoked a cigar, and wore a little <laughs> jacket. Uh, but Disney did get after them, uh, and the Marvel had to change that. So he we had, they had me put pants on him. <laughs> with his uh, little feet sticking out, you know. Sure. The duck feet sticking out at the bottom. Um, but the hat uh, was not ha a Donald's hat. It was a regular fedora beaten up, you know, like someone sat on for 10 years. Sure. And he, um, what else was it? Uh, just the pants and the hat and the cigar. So that separated him from, uh, but, uh, from Donald Duck. But nevertheless, it still looked like Donald Duck. Uh, the only other duck that was somewhat different was Daffy Duck. And so how many ways can you draw a duck? <laughs> well, and it's funny because you say he had kind of Donald's body, but I always felt he had Daffy's attitude. And even the expression you gave him kind of had that kind of angry Daffy. Yeah, he was always angry. So. <laughs> uh, he said he was born in a world he didn't ask to be born in and all that kind of thing. Absolutely. It opens up with an egg cracking. And then uh, that's how it started. And the, uh, when we got to do the syndicated strip, that was the very beginning of the syndicated strip, showing the egg and then Donald uh, stepping out, I guess, or peeking out. <laughs> and, and you said that was a back-breaking schedule for you to do both the strip oh, and books. Yeah, I didn't want to turn it down because it was a, a syndicate sure. thing. Uh, Stan promised me the moon and stars if I did it. And uh, none of those things came about because I didn't let go of Marvel's work, which was a good thing. Uh, and so I was burning the candles at both ends, and it eventually caught up with me. I just couldn't do it. Uh, I'd stay up almost all night wow. doing, um, like, um, I, I think it was uh, Dracula, and then doing uh, How the Duck. It got to the point where I just couldn't handle it and lost total interest in doing it. I, I was so tired, you know, and it sure. didn't feel so good. I was really uh, not having the money for myself or my family, but uh, for the, gave it to the doctors. Wow. Now, uh, some things translate well to film. Unfortunately, Howard the Duck was one that did not. No. Did you ever see the film? Never. <laughs> no, I never saw it because I heard about that. It would have been better if they had um, animated him. Yeah, like uh, like Roger Rabbit. Yeah. That, that would have been a good thing to do, see. Sure. And just Howard. But they was they, they went on the wrong path. But, you know, it's all experimentation. And it's pretty amazing because that was George Lucas. Yeah. So he didn't, he didn't think uh, ahead. Like, I, well, look, it's my opinion, and George Lucas had a different opinion. Just didn't work out. Sometimes, uh, you know, you win some and you lose some. Sure. Well, it doesn't diminish what you guys did on the book. It was wonderful. No. Uh, yeah, but the syndicate raised such hell because I dropped it right in the middle. I said, I have had enough. My health is in jeopardy here, and I can't do it. They said, what? You know, because they tied up a lot of advertising in it and money and all that. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't. My health comes ahead of you. And that's how it went. Did someone replace you then on the strip? Or? I think for a while, yeah, but it just died. Yeah, no, I rem and I remember reading it in the Chicago Tribune as a kid, the strip. Yeah. So I, I, if I had only that, it would have been fine, but it wouldn't have uh, really paid the bills. It was a poorly paid thing. Okay. So well, it, it just didn't work out. Financially, it didn't work out, nor could I actually get it out in time. Well, after after leaving Marvel, you went to D.C., and you did great work on, on Wonder Woman with Roy Thomas, I remember. Yes. And, I, uh, and, of course, Batman as well. I did Batman, and I did something that Moth had written similar to Dracula. Oh, Night... Uh, night Force. Night Force, oh, yes. I, th I think that was the first thing I started. Marv went there ahead of me. Okay, yes. And then he asked me to come on. 
and that was my opening to leave Marvel and go to DC. Was Night Force different enough from Dracula that it was, you know, kind of fresh and... Uh, a little feel, bit. Okay. Not, not all that much, a little bit. <laughs> Well, sure. the Night Force character, the main the main character, was very, very, very much like uh, Dracula in appearance. He had a cloak and everything. Sure, but um, uh, it was okay. Uh, it lasted for a very short time, and it just didn't didn't last at all. Eventually. Well, fans fans think of Batman and Daredevil as having a lot of similarities, and then someone who's worked on both characters. Yeah. Um, was there a difference to you in terms of approaching the character of Batman? Uh, no, Batman was fully formed, already established. I liked the costuming, and I just slid right in. I had no problem with it. I didn't have to think of anything. Everything was in its place before I took it. And and so I just, you know, got into it. It's one of the the next jobs they gave me. Was there ever, um, and you did so many of the Marvel characters, and also several DC characters, too, was there ever a specific character at either company that you wanted to draw but never got a chance? I wish I had done more westerns. Not characters so much, but westerns. I okay. did them all, all the characters pretty much. Uh, but I never got to do much early, early, very early. I did westerns, and then I started to, you know, do other things for different companies. I worked for Quality Comics too, and that's where Reed Crandall was working. He did Black Hawk. Yes. And I had never seen such beautiful pencils, pencils in my life. They would be left in the office there in the pencil stage. And I was just drop dead, eyes popping out of my head, looking at these things. And I said, well, I, I, I've got a lot to learn, you know. Wow. Why can't I get my work to look like this? And, and so I would study it and study it and try to apply it to my work. I was literally uh, uh, trying to capture his style. I, I had never met him, but uh, Brandon Eddy, well, no, wait a minute. Who did uh, The Vigilante? Mort Meskin. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, I never met him either, but I loved his work. That was at a time when I was trying to break into comics, and I didn't realize what I was getting into and how much I needed to know. So I had a Cook's tour of uh, D.C. and saw some really great stuff. I didn't even know that it was drawn uh, so large where I would just take out a, a pad at home, not realizing how it was done, and draw the the, ca the, the uh, little panels like they appeared in the comic book. Wow. That size, you know? right? Not realizing that you could draw it at larger scale, and they would that they would shrink it down. Yes, I never did. I never knew how they printed out these books. And uh, actually, I got my job with Stan with drawing that way. I did a war story on my own. I lettered it on my own, and and drew that small size and, and put the half tones in it, washes. You know? mm -hmm. And he hired me to, um, based on that. Wow. Let's talk about, uh, in the 80s, some of your work with Don McGregor. You did Nathaniel Dusk. Yes. Nathaniel Dusk. And Detective Zinx as well. He started with Marshall Rogers, but, but you did one of the Detective Zinx stories, yes, too. Yes, I did. And the, and the uh, period, a little period piece, I can't remember the name of it. No, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, he, he, he did that. I, I did the pen thing, and that's when they started to reproduce my pen thing. Well, because, yeah, that was going to lead me to my the other book of McGregor, so that you the two of you worked together on, uh, for Vanguard, The Spider. Yes. And uh, that uh, was sponsored by a man that I, Joel something. I can't remember his last name, but he called me, and, and he knew Don, and, and wanted me to do the illustration. Don was doing the writing, and so Don and I have been around quite a bit together. He did the pants of the Black Panther. Yes. Like and, uh, did you work with him on the Panther? Yes. Oh, that's cool. I did. And then I think John B. Simmons did some work, too. And then uh, we uh, we did a horror story for, I think, a model, uh, which was beautifully written. Oh, my. And the first of its kind. And very frightening and very believable. Um, it all takes place in a subway. Oh, so, wow. Uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, and Don and I did many things after that. And, Eventually, uh, it, we broke up. Yeah, that's too bad. And it, it sounds like it happened over this spider story? It happened over the spider story because it was right after 9-11. And uh, he had something in that story that I didn't approve of uh, because it was on the heels of 9-11. It was a similar situation. And uh, I didn't feel that the uh, the readership would ever appreciate that kind of thing at 
at that time. It was a terrorist plot. Yes, it was, and to blow up the Statue of Liberty. So uh, I didn't want to get into it, and uh, he was furious with me. And so I cooked up a way of trying to... He didn't even want to continue writing it. He was so upset. Oh, wow. And then uh, I came up with a plot for, for it, indicating all the destruction, but it was something that was like a bad dream to the main character, the spider, and uh, something that could have happened, but never does happen. It happens in his mind rather than actually happening. Right, and so that way I thought we could get around it and please him at the same time. But uh, he didn't want any of it to be like that. So uh, I think there was a plotting of the ways. You know, I, yeah, I still to this day don't feel it. Do not feel that it was a good thing to do. And so we ended it. <laughs> Well, now, you've had a couple uh, recent stories. I know you had a story for Dark Horse for their character, The Escapist. I did one. Yeah, a 22 page, something like that. That's cool. Did yeah. you, have you had a chance to read or you, have you heard about Michael Chabon's book, The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay? Yes, I, tr I, I had a recording of, it, of, the, of the book read by an actor. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, have you had an opportunity to meet uh, Michael Chabon at all? Yes, once at a, at a convention in San Diego. Oh, that's great. I met him there, and then I read uh, Glenn Gold. I met Glenn Gold, okay, who had written a, a different kind of a book, for and one of the bestseller lists. Boy, I tell you, through the conventions and the longevity of being in this business, I've met some very nice people. Well, they've all been inspired by work like people like yourself. Yeah, well, like. see, they they're younger. Sure. And so they remember my work before they even became professionals. I guess. Oh, right? absolutely. As the producer of The Last Batman was at the San Diego convention. I met him. He came right over the table. Is that Michael Uslan? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, the name sounds familiar, uh, but he was a sweet guy. He came over and talked to me for a few minutes. And, you know, uh, to me, for me to meet a Hollywood bigwig like that, uh, you know, made me feel pretty damn good. How do you think Hollywood is doing as a film buff yourself and as a comic book uh, expert? Uh, how is Hollywood doing in terms of interpreting these characters uh, in the current films? You mean the comic book characters? Yeah. How, how are they doing with them? Oh, I think they do superb work, uh, on, unlike uh, Spider-Man and, and the rest of it, and Batman. Did I you enjoy the that. new Batman? I have never seen it. I only saw the first one. Okay. The one from the 80s. Yeah. And after that, I didn't... Uh, you know, I, I did come to think Hollywood is noted for such fabulous films and, and taking very popular novels and turning them into films, why would they go to comic books? You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel. Why would they do that? Because they had screenwriters and such famous ones. Oh, sure. Why would they do such a thing? Yeah. And uh, I think it's because they thought it was a very saleable thing. And, you, you know, the studio system is no longer in existence. That's right. They got a lot of, a lot of new guys and, and all extremely young, uh, like, uh, they could be my children sure. at, at this point, and yet uh, they're the ones that are controlling Hollywood. The studio system is gone, and uh, all the, most of these films are made by a lot of new companies. It's not MGM or Universal, although they're still in business, or Paramount. Uh, uh, other uh, new line came along. Right. Uh, there, there's another one out there. There's several of them out there that uh, didn't exist at that time. So... Uh, that's life, you know. Sure. The motor, uh, the uh, stagecoach had to give way to the automobile, <laughs> and the Fisher body people that would turn out uh, these beautiful stagecoaches in its time had to uh, do something else. And when the cars became popular, uh, they would have like the Cadillac would have the Fisher body made, yes. by, you know, made by the Fisher people. Yes. And they used to make stagecoaches, so they had to just plain keep up with the times. And so things have changed. You know, you ask an old me, an old guy. Uh, how are things today compared to when you was a young man? He, and he would say, well, they was much better then. You know, when I was a young youngster, oh, you can't compare it. And and uh, that's the way I feel myself. But there are, you know, it's interesting. There are artists today who have very contemporary styles, but I think compare favorably uh, with your work as well. And I wonder if, have you had a chance to talk to a guy like Alex Ross? Because as a painter, he seems to tap into that same yes, vein no, of realism as, as yours. I know. Very realistic. No, yeah. I never met him. Okay. How about Neil Adams? A guy like oh, that? yeah. I know Neil. 
and uh, wonderful artwork. Yeah. Do you guys ever discuss your styles with each other? No. Not okay. Styles, but uh, no. Okay. No, I don't know. Intimately, I don't know. Okay. But I've I've met him a few times, and we spoke a few times. Uh, he has a company of his own. He does uh, advertising too. Yes, continuity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted me to do some work for him, but I didn't want to. I just never got together with him. Well, do you have any uh, new stories coming out? Uh, do you have anything coming up? No, I actually turned down something from a dark horse. I, 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 I can't say it's written in stone, but at the moment it takes too much out of me to do a story. I understand. It's, there are long, long hours at the board, and I, you know, sure. I'm getting on, and I'm 79 now. And yes, I happy birthday, by the way, yes, last thank, month. Yeah, yeah, thank you, but... Uh, I think it's, I, I love doing commissions, but I'd like to get out of the, doing all these comic things. I'd like to spread out and do something with art itself. Would you like to paint? Yeah, well, painting with pencil. I've, I've done some things with uh, casein and uh, acrylics that I have in my home. Yeah, I've done some of these things in the past, but I still would like to get away from these comic book characters, which I do not own. You know, it's, these are all syndicated characters. And I would prefer to do something else, and I don't know if the fans would come along with that. What they want are in comic books, and they want these characters, and that's what they're interested in. Well, you're like a singer performing a song. And, mm. and you know, people people want, you know, sometimes I think people want to hear, they, they both want to hear the old favorites, but I think they're also willing to... to see what what's new and that's what it's what's nice about some of the work you've done for things like dark horse that yes. haven't been superhero and you've been able to kind of you know no, but it's, it's still uh it's, um uh, it's still uh panel to panel work sequential art a sequential art right and um it's long and it's uh, tedious sure and sometimes there's six or seven panels on a page that's a lot of work and then, uh, and then it, it, to make it pay or to even meet the deadlines, you've got to do more than a page a day. Yeah. I can't really quite make it beyond the page a day. Wow, um, that's that's I, pretty amazing that you're still able to do a page a day. Even. Yeah, but I, I've had enough of it. I understand. Uh, I have enough. And I, on top of it, I have glaucoma. Oh, uh, wow. And both eyes, and I'm only really working out of one. So, you know, uh, it's amazing I can do what I do. Wow. Well, you know, it's. I, I'm glad that people, you know, are able to go to your website at genecolon.com, and you know, it's it's great to see that uh, you are able to still do oh, yeah. great sketches. I, I can still. It's amazing how you can make up for a deficiency. You can do things that you never thought you could do. Once I sit down at the board, something takes over, and I can really turn out some still some fairly decent work. Well, I can agree with that. <laughs> so so uh, I kind of like to get in a, into another area of art and see if the fans would be interested in seeing it or buying it. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to test the waters there. Have you displayed any of these new directions on your website? Mm -hmm. I have a uh, like a, a gallery of my work. Okay. But most of it is comics, all comic, comic uh, hero characters. Uh, but not not much else other than commissions. Now, they... Somebody commissioned me, uh, two somebody commissioned me to do Jack the Ripper. Okay. I did one a long time ago of Jack the Ripper waiting in the shadows in, on a London street, a foggy night, and, a, and, a, and a, there's a woman ahead uh, walking towards him, but that is not aware of him there. He's, sure. He's in the extreme foreground, and she's way in the background. And then you see the, the London streets at night, you know, and the wet pavement. I love all that uh, atmosphere stuff. And See, that has nothing to do with comics. Right. Well, you know, I, hope right? You, I hope you have the opportunity to show some of these new directions on your website and make the I fans think, aware of it. Yeah, I think so. That would be a good thing to do. I don't know how interested they would be because they're all fans of comic books. Uh, and that's really what they want and what they're interested in buying. But who knows, you know, if I send it out there, maybe it'll fly. And that's GeneColon.com. Yeah. I hope it works out. And, Thank uh, you very much. And, and I, uh, I appreciate the fact that as an artist, you're, you're still going in different directions and yeah. setting new horizons for yourself. It's very, it's very pleasurable to be able, it's a lot of fun to be able to create, go into an area, an area you haven't been in before. Well, the talent is still there. Yeah, and, and thank that, you. And then we, we wish you luck. And, and again, we, I appreciate your time tonight. I, you thank know, you so much. We've covered a lot of ground, and, and it's, it's a marvelous career, and it's been my thank pleasure you. to reflect with you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Here you go. Uh, I expect to do more of these as I lead up to my uh, 15th anniversary. I don't even know what I'm going to do for the 15th anniversary, but uh, a great conversation with uh, the late Gene Colan. I miss him. I know we all do. He was a great sweetheart of a guy, as I said, and um, couldn't have been more gracious. In fact, I don't know if I revealed this or not on the uh, on the replay, but uh, we did the interview, and uh, the first time I spoke to him in 2005, and I was still fumbling with my equipment, and it just didn't sound right. And actually, the the audio, uh, you know, wasn't just wasn't airable. And I was like the the arrogance on my part to then approach him, then literally the next day and say, "Mr. Cullen, I'm so sorry it didn't record. Could could we please?" Redo it. Oh, yeah, I like talking to you. You remind me of Bob Costas. Now, as a radio broadcaster, that's like one of the highest compliments I've ever gotten. And he couldn't have been sweeter about it. Um, so I once again uh, was able to sit down, and that's why I reference our previous conversation. Um, it made me a little more confident in what we talked about. But what a sweetheart of a guy. I, I just, I'm shaking my head right now. What, what a tremendous guy. And I, I really, most of the people in comic books are nice people. But uh, Gene was really, couldn't have been sweeter. And I saw him with other fans as well. He was always incredibly appreciative of uh, the fandom. And uh, we miss him. What else can I say? Gene Colon on today's Word Balloon. You know, there's another uh, companion Word Balloon that's coming out in uh, just about an hour or so. And that's a new conversation with Dave Gibbons. I'm shaking my head again because uh, I, I love the fact that Dave comes back and we had a wonderful conversation. Uh, he saw HBO's Watchmen. Of course he did. He's got thoughts on that. He even uh, mentions a few thoughts on uh, a few more thoughts than he initially did about before Watchmen and even about uh, Doomsday Clock, which I found interesting. But we just had a nice breezy conversation. Really great talking to him about so many different uh, subjects. And uh, I'm happy to share that with you today as well for a new episode for the weekend. So uh, be looking for on your feed if you are uh, just satisfied with what you got today with Gene Colan. No, no, no. In a couple hours, you should have an additional conversation with Dave Gibbons as well. And even a new review of Star Trek Picard because uh, things just got busy on Thursday and I wasn't able to put it out with Franco. But we both watched the episode and we'll uh, give you our thoughts on that. So a nice uh, triple header for the weekend from Word Balloon. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, brought to you by uh, Aftershock Comics. Uh, Great stuff coming from Aftershock, including... I'm so excited for Artemis and the Assassins by Stephanie Phillips next month to uh, be there right along uh, other great new books like John Lehman's The Man Who Effed Up Time and Zach Thompson's Undone by Blood, God Killers from Mark Sable, uh, you know, Matthew Clickstein's You Are Obsolete, Animosity from Marguerite Bennett, Baby Teeth from Donny Cates and Gary Brown, and A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Gordon Suzuka, and of course, uh, Garth's wonderful Jimmy's Bastards. Uh, so many great books. Paul Jenkins, Cullen Bunn, Tim Seeley, Phil Hester, so many of my good friends have done work at Aftershock Comics. And I'm telling you, you're going to find a book that you'll like from Aftershock. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and how to get these stories either digitally or the diamond codes to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon, and thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners, through your support via Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon, or uh, click on the uh, Patreon ad right there on the front page of WordBalloon.com. Until next time, have a great weekend. Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2020.